Thanks, guys. You guys always do a great job. Appreciate it immensely. <clears throat> on uh, on Wednesday nights, we uh, um, we we break bread together at five thirty, and then we uh, junior high and senior high have a, a youth group and uh, Awana. They run all over the place. They do games in the gym and. And uh, nursery is available. And oh, just real quick about the nursery. Um, last week there was uh, 75 babies in the nursery. And uh, yeah, I'm telling you, we're like uh, rodents up there. And uh, the nursery people said, they said, they, they said, pastor. Like it was my fault. Like I made them all, you know, pastor. You know how many kids were up there? I said, you know how many kids were in the auditorium? They said, that's how many kids were up there. I said, isn't that cool? Aren't we blessed? And I tried to wind them down a little bit, you know, because they're like, we can't have that many people come to church. That's not our goal. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Man, it's funny. We, we, get, we get so routine. Like I had this, this one person came in the auditorium. She said, there is not a place to sit. I'm like, hallelujah, praise God. That's the goal. You know, there's a lot of good pagans out there and they need to get their butts in here. You know, we're looking for more chairs. Like, oh my gosh, what a great problem to have before. It'd be like, you know, oh look, we wonder if anybody likes Jesus anymore. So, um, so the uh, nursery workers beat on Paula Hahn and, and uh, Pastor Josh, me and a few other people and they said, we have to change. And uh, um, when women who have little kids are mean like that. We just do whatever they say. It's just, you know, like, yes. Yes, you, oh, you need another one? What can we do? We'll get somebody to cut a door in half for you and we'll move it for you. And we want a window. Fine, we'll buy a window. So uh, when you go upstairs, uh, check it out. It's really cool. When you walk up the stairs and you make a left, because if you make a right, you, you won't go anywhere. Make a left, uh, Paula Hahn. He cut a door in half, and we put an infant and crawling uh, nursery or something like that. It's a crawling infant, you know, for the itty-bitty ones. And then the regular nursery is uh, for those that can walk on and crawl on top of each other and, uh, are not, and, and aren't potty trained. And the rule is if you're three and you're potty trained, how many people are potty trained in here? I feel bad for some of you that aren't. My goodness. A lot of depends out there today. Oh, I, I think I'm potty trained. Um, anyways, uh, uh, then, then those uh, uh, toddlers will go downstairs and uh, Josh and the Promised Land people are making a class for them. So, uh, listen, it's, it, it's a blessing to be a little bit overcrowded. We, uh, we uh, uh, or, or get that parking lot. Well, we don't care. We just park, park wherever, but be polite, please. Don't park in front of people's driveways. Just, I'm, I'm so excited that, uh, I'm excited that you're excited about coming to church, uh, because nowhere else, you know, do you get to study the word. Um, and uh, I hear every excuse in the book about, uh, you know, Pastor, I, uh, I do my church in the woods with a rifle. I go, well, that's, that's cool. So, uh, are you growing in the grace and knowledge of your Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, yes, I am. I go, well, I'm backing away now so God doesn't take and accidentally hit me with a lightning bolt, you liar. Now, I don't mind recreating. I think it's great to get out there and I don't care if you get out there on a Sunday and but, you know, it's, it's like, really, you know, there's, as Brian said, there's a million different reasons why not to show up on Sunday. And, and I know that. Uh, matter of fact, just this morning, my wife was hugging me and, and saying, can we stay home today? And I said, well, I kind of got to go, honey. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I can get out of it. <laughs> I go, you can stay home. She goes, yeah, but... 
I got to say hello to people. I go, well, I hope you change your attitude. <laughs> no, it was fine. We love coming here, but I, I guarantee you guys got to understand we're all, we all get just as busy. We all get, we all get just as tired. Um, but my prayer is that when you show up, God breathes life into you. And so when you leave here, you go, that was good. God, God taught me something that I did not think I was going to learn. <clears throat> we are. Uh, for you guys that have been with us for quite a while now, we're, we're, I'm giving it my best shot to w make it through the book of, the whole book of the Bible, from Genesis to the Apocalypse. And, and we're in First Samuel. And um, you, you guys that are with us for, for have been with us since the beginning of First Samuel. It, you guys are going to learn. It's one of my favorite books to teach. It's it's just life. You know, one thing cool about the Old Testament it shows that God is a God of wrath. I mean, so many people think that God is just some kind of a wimpy God. That you know, oh, everything's good. God loves me. Blah blah blah. You know, and here it's like uh, you obey God. Or he kills you. You know, isn't that good? That isn't like that today. And he has this chosen people called Israel, who he called out through Abraham. And he said, Abraham, your people are going to represent me here on this earth. And those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. And that's the way it's going to be. And Abraham... You know, and then his people all the way up through to the Exodus, and then God reveals himself again. But all the time, the coolest thing is, is they always forget the goodness of God. And probably the greatest condolence for you and I is we do too. We forget the goodness of God. We forget how gracious God has been to you and I. And so we see that play out over and over and over again. And m maybe we get a little like, oh, I can't believe they just saw God, you know, give them manna. Uh, part the Red Sea, you know, uh, save them from the serpent's bite, and then they forget. And, and they just saw the glory of God on Mount Sinai. You know, when God comes down, maybe in a flying saucer. Did you know that? Well, I just made that up, but uh, he said he comes down with flames. However he got down there, he comes down, and he, and, he, and he puts up the perimeter, and he says, don't go beyond the perimeter. If you do, you will die. And of course, there's a few, few guys that wanted to sneak and see the glory of God, and they probably died. And, uh, uh, and God makes all these phenomenal uh, rules and conditions. And on the upside, as long as they followed him, oh my goodness, they were blessed beyond belief. And then we get to First Samuel because it's the last of the judges, and the judges were the ones that were playing out God's orders here on the earth, and they come through, and they ask for a king, and they said, listen, we want to be like everybody else. We want to be like Mike. And we want to be like Mike. We want to be like everybody else. Give us a king. And Sam was like, no, you don't want a king. Yes, we do. And this is what's going to happen if you have a king. And they go, we don't care. Give us a king. They give him a king. And they end up with King Saul. King Saul seems to be pretty cool. He's a handsome dude. He's tall. He's tall, dark, and handsome. There we go. And, uh, uh, that, and then that's Saul. But Saul, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Everybody say that. Absolute power. Okay, one more time. Absolute. One more time so everybody gets it. Listen, um, I realize, and I don't want to sound uh, wrong in this. Growing up in Chicago and Detroit, congregations would actually talk back to the pastor. I mean, they would let him know he was doing good or bad. Now, we're in Great Falls, Montana. And... Uh, not, not, we're not a real talkative group of people, you know. Um, so, how do I say this without being? So, listen. If I if I go, listen. We're just trying to get a point across, and the point is, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and and y'all should understand that, right? Y'all get absolute power corrupts absolutely. Okay, just wow. Oh, this is a tough crowd. They're like, we're not saying anything, Pastor. Do you guys know absolute power corrupts absolutely? Yes. Oh, man. Give somebody a high five and say, I got that answer right. Yes. 
Come on, we're in church, we're going to get together in church. Because that's exactly what happens, man. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And pretty soon, Saul thinks that he is the king. Well, he is the king. No, he thinks he is the king. No, he, he is the king, and he thinks he is the king. But he forget who's the real king. Because the, the one that put him in the power, God Almighty, gave him the position of being king. But he's not the king, but he is the king. Some of you people have worked for a person who understood their position and their authority. And you appreciated their position and authority. And they did not lord anything over you. And you thought it was fantastic. But then you worked for somebody who had the title and position and authority. And you said, I do not want to work for this person because they think they are everything. Right? Yes. All right. So some of you guys have worked for people like that. So Saul thinks he's... He's king, he's the real king, and he starts stepping up bounds. He starts heading south. And he doesn't do exactly what the Lord tells him to do. Samuel, in 15, where we left it last week, Samuel said, listen, you're going to go wipe out the Amalekites. I want you to kill everything. I want you to kill it all. And he does not. And the prophet Samuel comes to Paul and says, Saul, and he says, Saul, listen, here's the deal. It is better to obey than to sacrifice. And you did not obey. The most important thing you can do is obey. Don't, don't think that you figured it out. You were just supposed to obey. And don't give me the excuse that you're going to sacrifice, you know. No, to obey is better. Obedience, uh, faith. To define faith would be trusting obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. And so, um, he says rebellion is a is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the commands of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And that's the end of it for Saul. Samuel walks away, Paul, and I keep calling Saul, Paul. Saul, Samuel, the prophet Samuel is walking while, and Samuel is so distraught, he reaches out and grabs his, uh, his garment, and the garment rips, and... Samuel turns around and says, listen, Saul, as you have ripped my garment, God has ripped the kingdom away from you. And you're done. <clears throat> Chapter 16, uh, Samuel uh, anoints David as king. How many of you guys have heard of King David? Okay, just about everybody. And uh, let's, uh, let's, I want to I go through this. Verse 14 of uh, 16 says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. So um, Samuel goes and sees Jesse, meets all the boys, and uh, David is anointed with the oil, and he is to be king of Israel. And then the spirit that God had placed upon Saul is gone. And he says, Now the Spirit of the Lord has left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit, and has filled him with depression and fear. And who, any of you who ever have dealt with depression, you know that fear comes right with it. Because, you know, you go to a black spot in your life, and it's such a dark area. And then within that darkness becomes, what's going on around me? Who's after me? And fear, and fear starts to flood your soul. And so you have this depression and fear. Now you have a ruler, a king who is dealing with depression and fear. And uh, um, so this is what he's going to do about it. He uh, uh, says, Saul's servant said to him, a, a tormenting spirit from God. Uh, let me apologize. Let me. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting at verse 14. I'm sorry. I'll, oh, you probably know that. Al's good. That's all I got to say, Al. He's good up there. He just, he reads my mind. Thanks, Al. So, follow along here. <clears throat> Some Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. 
Let us find a good musician to play the harp wherever the, whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you. He will play soothing music, and you, and, and you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said. Find me someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the certain sets, uh, one of Jesse's um, sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, he is a brave warrior, a man of war and good judgment. He is also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messages to Jesse, say, send me your son David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul, along with a young goat, donkey loaded with bread and, and, a, and, and, a, and a boatload of wine. So, so David went to Saul and began serving him. Saul loved David very much, and David became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, asking, please let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. As the psalm says the uh, music is uh, soothing to the soul. And so we're going to find out, though, that Saul is going to actually have a problem with David. But, uh, uh, you know, he's listening to a good harp player, and uh, uh, he seems to be better. Um, now we go to uh, the world famous battle of uh, David and Goliath and um, you know I, I think sometimes we think it's so doggone familiar we, we sometimes miss some of the most some of the best parts in this text um, I was talking to who's going to be uh, the lady speaker at the summer, uh, Carrie Powers, and uh, there's a secular book out there called David and Goliath. And it's more more about uh, just people doing life. And uh, the author looks at it from a totally, uh, not, not necessarily a biblical perspective, but I think it is kind of a biblical perspective. And the perspective is this. We all have Goliaths in our lives. Do we run at them or do we run away? Do we accept the challenge or, or do we fold? You know? Is cancer your Goliath? Is a divorce your Goliath? Is a financial crisis your Goliath? You may have, your Goliath may look totally different than somebody else's Goliath, but you have a Goliath there in front of you. Do you run at it? Do you trust God? And do you say, God, we are going to overcome? Or do you let it whip you? Or do you just run away? Right? Would you guys agree with that? We all have Goliaths in our lives. And how about what people, when they see your Goliath and you share with them the Goliath in your life, the advice sometimes you get, yeah, get out of there. Go, run. You know, very seldom do we have enough close friends that love us enough to say, what can I do to help? Most of the time it's, yeah, you're on your own, sucker. You could die. You could go bankrupt. I'm not helping you. You know, um, but here's the deal. David, who is he? He's a shepherd. Plays good music. And uh, what we know more, what we're going to get to know more about David is he loves God. We can see King Saul. What has happened to King Saul? King Saul thinks he's the king. He forgot about God. God gave him an order. He did almost all of it, and then he... You know, he, he made, a, he made a, a, a statue of himself and said, There I am. Worship me. And then when Samuel goes, Saul, what's up? Oh, well, you know. And God goes, That's it. You're done. You are so done. And he's no longer. And then there's this young shepherd. And what does a shepherd do? He hangs out in the bush. And he protects sheep. And he has a, a staff and a knife, maybe. And he has no fear. No fear. I have been out. How many of you guys have been stuck out in the woods by yourself at night? At night. God, I hate it. I'm a wuss. Seriously, I'm not a David. I mean, you know, I think David said, I, I hope something sneaks up tonight because I want to take it out. And I think his question to God, what do you got? What, what do we got tonight, God? Grizzly bear action? Wolf? I mean, it, it is just, 
this guy's character, him and God, are so tight. Because there was no one else around. It was him and God. Him and God and a bunch of sheep. And he protected them. And then he, he never ran away. You know, he was a first responder. He ran into the burning house. He ran into the firefight. He, was the, he stopped on the highways at the accident. He was a first responder. There was no fear. And so Jesse says, Dave, I want you to go bring your brothers some bread, some salami. You know, go check out, see what's going on. And so when David shows up to the, to the battlefront, and he's like, what's up? And the other soldiers go, check out the big dude across, across the way. And, uh, uh, you know, he's cursing Israel and cursing their God. David's like, what's with this? What's wrong with you guys? And the word of God tells us, they go, well, you know, here's the deal. It's going to be like a Goliath against one of us. And Goliath is, dude, is big. And David's like, what are you guys, a bunch of pansies? Don't you know we have the living God on our side? What's wrong with you? And then probably the guys are going, well, here's the deal, Dave. You know, if whoever kills the giant, well, we kind of win the battle. And the king says, you get to marry his daughter. And this is the best. The best. You don't have to pay taxes. You know, come on. I know. I just finished my taxes because I do it every year in October. I'd be like, yes! That alone might motivate some people to go, man, you know, death and taxes it's got to come together let's get rid of the taxes I don't think that motivated David and I think you know when Moses wrote it down he goes he thought to himself you know this would be kind of cool people would get a kick out of this and uh, and so the text tells us that uh, David goes and, and sees King Saul now it seems like King Saul can't remember David but remember King Saul is whacked right He'd be in the loony bin if there was one, but he's the king, so he's not there. And uh, he said, he says, Saul, King Saul, I, I, I got to wipe this guy out. I'm going to take care of Goliath for you. King Saul, like, listen, you scrawny, redhead little dude. No, you're not. He goes, oh, yeah. You know, and seeing as Saul has nothing to lose, it's like, all right, said, listen, why don't you go ahead and take my armor, my sword, my helmet, go ahead and put this on. And the text tells us that David puts this on. It's just so encumbersome. And, he, and he, he says, listen, King, I apologize. This stuff is just very uncomfortable. And, and what is he? He says, you know, um, this is kind of like David's story. Uh, he said, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from the mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaws and club it to death. I have done this both to lions and bears, and I'll do it to that pagan Philistine too. For he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord has rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear, and he will rescue me from this Philistine. If God is for me, who can be against me? He would have wrote it in Romans 8, 31. If God is for me, who can be against me? No one. I got it. So, amen. Yeah, so he he goes down, and there's, a, a, you know, in, 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 in the study of this battle, there's always this, this question, why didn't the Philistines attack? Why didn't Israel attack? Why did they just have this stalemate? Well, they figured maybe these Two people could deal with it because they both had ridges. They both had to go down to a valley. They both had to go up and attack each other. And they just thought the casualties and the death would be too overwhelming. So strategically, we're not going to do it. Maybe David wasn't that strategic. He just said, you know what? You're a pagan. You're making fun of my God. And he goes, you know, one of the Ten Commandments was, thou shalt not take the, Lord of my, the, the, the name of the Lord thy God in vain or abuse it. You can use any other adjective you want, but do not take my Lord's name and use it that way. And so it says that David goes down, gets five rocks, and let's face it, 
he's one big dude and he's looking down and here comes this punk and he's coming up at him and he's cursing at him you know filth foul foul and filth you filthy foul filth filth foul and uh david's like yeah whatever and uh you know and he puts that uh stone in a sling hurls that bad boy around and it says it, it it hits the skull of the giant and it penetrates deep most likely doesn't kill the giant but the giant falls down and while the giant's down there is absolutely no fear in David he doesn't care who's looking who's watching he runs over he grabs the sword of the giant and he decapitates the giant he picks up the head in victory. Israel is jacked. They run after. They run down. They run up. And the Philistines are in shock. They start running. And the word of God tells us that they just ran after and killed and killed and plundered and killed. And they wiped them out. And he, and he goes back to King Saul. And he goes back to King Saul. And he hands him the head of the beast. The name of my talk, though, is Jealousy Kills. Is Jealousy Wants to Kill. Chapter 18, verse 1. I'll make this as fast as I can. After David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, uh, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them. And uh, 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 for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him uh, as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robes and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Whatever Saul uh, asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him commander over uh, the men of war. An appointment by the people and Saul's officers alike. When the victorious Israel army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul is ticked. Saul is like, uh-oh. And jealousy engulfs with this tormenting spirit, with this depression and fear. He now is jealous, so jealous, he hates, he hates the success of David, and he wants to kill him, and we're going to see that, you know, he's going to take advantage of times when David's just playing for him, he throws a spear at him, spear at him, and he wants to pin him to the wall, and David moves, but he's enraged, He's enraged in jealousy. Uh, me, and, me and my bride like to watch those, those news shows where, you know, it shows these people who are madly in love with each other and then one goes off and does something very stupid and the other one is jealous or, and they plot to kill him. You know, it's, it's always good. You know what I'm saying? You always know. But it's always amazing how they get caught. You know, these detectives do this phenomenal work. Boop, boop, boop. And, but you see what jealousy does to people. Right? I mean, it, it starts when you're a little kid and your friend gets a, a nicer bike than you. And so you go, I don't like you anymore. Jealousy, man, it, it's, it's, it's so unhealthy. It'll cause you to do... It, it, it's, it's on the road to death. Now, there's one more thing we got to look at. We have to look and see how far Israel 
is, is left God. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to Exodus 15. Exodus 15. We see in, in 1 Sam that they were writing songs about, about David and Saul. You know, they sing that song, uh, Saul has killed a thousand and David's tens of thousands. Yahoo! Boom, 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 boom. Whatever. And they're dancing in the streets with that, okay? Uh, David, let's face it. I, I, David, do you think David cared about the song? Nah, no way. He didn't care about the song. Because he, it was him and God. He knew it. This is where Israel was after the Exodus. They, uh, they finished crossing uh, the Red Sea, and it was dry. And they got together, and they wrote a song. Let me give you the words. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord. I will not sing to Moses, Aaron. I'm not going to sing to Saul, David. It says, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled both horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and army has, has, has hurled, he has hurled into the sea. The finest of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deepest waters gushed over him. They sank to the bottom like stone. Your right hand, your right hand, O oh Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O oh Lord, smash the enemy. It doesn't talk about anybody else but God. Yeah, amen. So do you get it? Do you get where do you get where Saul is? Do you get where Saul has led the nation? They have become a follower of Saul and not of God. Worst thing that could happen. They became a follower of a man instead of a follower of God. The whole nation has gone to hell in a handbasket. They've all, they can't figure it out. And, and hopefully, we're going to look at King David, and hopefully and prayerfully, because what's most amazing is God's still with Israel. They're still wiping people out. God is still blessing them. And that kind of gives us that grace of the New Testament because we all, we all adulterate, we're all foolish like that, but God still blesses us, he still loves us. And, and we're going to see David give it a shot to turn all of Israel back to God because they have just, they have screwed up. They've, give, they've gone down the different path. And he's going, man, you gotta, you got to get back. you got to get back and give God all the glory. So here's the deal. You know those Goliaths that you have in your life? A divorce you might have staring in, in your face. A financial disaster that you might have staring in your face. An illness, cancer, something that you might have staring in your face. You might have this massive Goliath in your face. Well, here's the deal. You will, you will overcome. God tells us in the apocalypse that we are overcomers. And with God, you will overcome. You just got to remember when you overcome, you win the battle. All glory to God in the highest. All glory to God in the highest. It's not you. It's absolute power corrupts absolutely. And God does fantastic things in your life. And if you want him to keep doing fantastic things in your life, you keep giving him the glory. I'm a baseball freak. Not as freaky as Dave Douglas. He's a super baseball freak. So I'm going to end with this quick story. There's this guy. He hit three home runs in the World Series. Fantastic player. What was his name, Dave? Come on, Dave. There you go, Reggie Jackson, baby. There's an old person like me, Reggie. Reggie loves God. He loved God. He hit three home runs. He became famous. We, we, yeah, Mr. October, yeah. We, we for, he forgot that he, he loved God. I mean, there's so many examples today that go, oh, yeah, I love God, and then all of a sudden their fame hits them, and they go, oh, who's God? I don't know. God is going to do great things in your life. Don't be Saul. Don't forget it. Bring him all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. When you beat up on your Goliath, you thank God.
every day. You thank God every day. Would you please stand, join hands. Brian, you want to come and close us in prayer quickly? Quickly is the, uh, yeah. There's the, the famous saying that, that God doesn't give us anything in our lives that we can't handle, and that's false. A lot of times he does give us stuff in our lives for the sole purpose that we can rely on him. And so if you are in that moment where you're trying to face something that there's a Goliath in front of you, and sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a hurdle that's awesome. It's because God wants you to go to him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the Goliaths in our lives. And I pray that, that we pray that everyone here can look at those Goliaths and we can be more like David and give you all the glory. We can be less like Saul, less selfish. We can be more glorifying to you in everything that we do. Even if it's not a Goliath, Lord, even if it's just something that's just so mundane that we feel like it's just the same thing every day, that, Lord, we can still glorify you in it so that we may bring more glory to you, so that we may be closer to you, that we can hold your hand through everything that we do. And I pray that in this, this ministry right here at The Rock that we can realize that it is not about raising one person, but it's about raising you and raising fellowship and raising each other uh, so that we may just uh, bring more people to eternity. We thank you so much for this Sunday, and thank you again to all of the volunteers and everybody that makes today possible, including you. Uh, we, we ask uh, everything in your son's name. We leave it the most level playing field there is for the cross. And everybody said, amen.